We have huge disparities in who has access to health. I think that patient would rather have survived with their privacy in, without their privacy intact. It's the big problem in medicine, number one, adherence. Bill Gates once said, uh, we all tend to overestimate what will happen in a year and underestimate what will happen in a decade. When shall we cure cancer? Daniel, thanks for finding the time and for the amazing opportunity of getting some insights into the future of healthcare. You've spoken a lot about the future of health and innovations powered by new tools, which most of us now literally keep at our bedside. Sometimes a bed itself is smart enough to read your vitals during the night. Duke University's smart toilet now utilizes artificial intelligence to monitor bowel health. Lots of items around us are becoming increasingly medicalized. What other interesting opportunities do you see in the application of houseware and personal items for healthcare purposes? Great question. Uh, number one, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an exciting time in, in health and care in general. Uh, and as you mentioned, now our homes are becoming you know, smarter. We live not just in the time of internet of things, but in the internet of medical things. And they don't often need to be, need to be medical. You know, your, your mattress isn't necessarily a medical device, but a low cost sensor in there, one that isn't even FDA grade can track your vital signs, your respiratory rate um, and stages of your sleep. And I think what's important is, isn't necessarily the data that these devices, whether it's your toilet, your mattress, your wearable, your camera, your voice, it's the insights that we can glean from them. And since you mentioned the mattress uh, uh, or your wearable device or bedside sensors, they can track something as normal and every day as sleep. Uh, and sleep we know is so critical to uh, your risk for everything from diabetes to heart disease, to mental health issues, to risk for cancer that if we're starting to understand our sleep and our patterns and can take something with not just the raw data of our sleep, but the insights and maybe how to coach you to go to bed earlier or to uh, avoid caffeine or to help you meditate or an, um, improve your environment, that can make a, a big difference in your individuals or your patient's uh, health uh, and outcomes. So uh, I like to think more about not just the little siloed sensors, toilet, wall, cameras, but how you put those together. And as our houses get smarter, sometimes it might be as simple as how often you're opening your fridge or older patients. Sometimes maybe if they stop using the coffee pot at the same time every day, something's happening and they might have a risk of a, a fall or you might need to call and check in. So these new internet of medical things can be used, I think, in, in more and more powerful ways. And it's not just the, those that track our vitals or our steps or our mental health. Right. In one of my recent articles on Forbes, I've addressed just a couple of challenges facing the evolution of intelligent systems, such as gaps in effective management and integration of data, the level of AI maturity, the absence of empathy. What's your view on the challenges or even the threats associated with the use of this technology in modern healthcare? That's a great question. Well, let's start with the data side. I mean, we live in this exponential age. I mean, it's only been 12 years. The first Fitbit launched in 20. 2009. Now I'm wearing like four devices. I have my Whoop, which is great for exercise. I have my Aura Ring. I have my Apple Watch. I have an underwearable from Spire. Um, I have my voice that can be detected and my smartphone. So think of all these things, you know, collecting even terabytes of, of data. Now each of us as individuals, as patients, as consumers, and each of us who are lucky enough to be healthcare providers and clinicians, we don't want the, the data. It can be overwhelming. It doesn't mean much. Even though data is the new oil, what we really want is to connect the dots between these different data sources, often which are don't have interoperability and don't play well together, but go from data to actionable insights and insights that are relevant to me as an individual or if you are my patient. And often if we might have the insight, it might be a new publication around a digital health therapeutic or even a clinical drug. There's often a big gap between getting the knowledge and being applied at the bedside or at the website. So I think one of the big challenges now, particularly from the clinician side, we don't want more data. A patient showing up with all their Fitbit data and scale and blood pressure and glucose, it's overwhelming. We don't want to be liable for the information. What we want to have is the AI engines, or I like to call them IA, intelligence augmentation, to help synthesize that. And it could be back to our connected uh, smart uh, mattress or wearable that looks at our sleep. Now, for example, my um, Aura Ring doesn't just show me my um, stages of sleep. It gives me a synthesized sleep score. Same thing can happen with a Fitbit or others. But what is really interesting from the medical side is my resting heart rate might be tracked. Normally I'm about 52, my lowest heart rate when I sleep. But what, what would happen if my resting heart rate was going from 52 to 62 to 72 over a few days or weeks? What else is going on with my physiology? How do we not just take the spot data 
uh, but integrate that with context of my comorbidities, my genetics, my lifestyle, my sociome, and put that together. And I think AI, machine learning, all these new algorithms are at the early stages. I'm starting to sort of synthesize that in a way I sometimes like to summarize like as a check engine light for your body. Yes, your smartwatch can tell if you've had a fall. It might tell whether you have atrial fibrillation. But part of this future will be to look at your baseline, look at those subtle changes and integrate that and push that information to you or your, to your uh, nutritionist, your, your uh, doctor, your nurse, your pharmacist in ways that really make sense to you and are improving knowledge for all of us as we go forward. So lots of challenges. And one of them is connecting the dots. One of them is making that actionable flow. And from the doctor or nurse or healthcare perspective, to make sure it integrates into workflow. Because as of today, we're speaking in the fall of 2021, my new iOS 15 on my Apple uh, smartphone now makes it much easier to share data, not with just my friends and my family, but with my doctor or my health system. And the challenge is, what does that data mean in context? We don't know what my changing and resting heart rate might mean. What does my digital exhaust, my digital mean uh, from a relatively healthy individual or for someone who has diabetes or heart disease or COVID. So I think we're going to learn to make sense of this information and context. That's one of the big challenges or one of the big opportunities. Right. I, I totally agree. You've touched a very important uh, area, the interoperability of data. It's, it's very important. I think it's, it's probably never been of such an issue as now with the abundance of all those devices that we currently have. But we'll come to that. I just wanted to get back a little bit to the intelligent machines, they have not taken the Hippocratic Oath and obviously do have issues with empathy. So how in this case should we address the questions of ethics and responsibility? Will AI will ever be able to not only follow clinical protocols and predefined logics, but also take ethical and morally balanced decisions like a human doctor? Yeah, that's a great one. I mean, in, in the terms of ethics and regulations, often the technology is moving faster than our institutions and our regulators and our governments can keep up with, including in AI and genetic editing and genetic engineering. And uh, so I think we need to pay attention to where the technology is, where it's heading, and help our clinicians and our ethics boards try and make sense of it. You mentioned empathy, right? Or rules-based medicine. Um, you, we know that there's a lot of, um, in some systems and some studies, the, the fourth leading cause of death is medical errors. So just because you have a human in the loop doesn't mean you're going to be doing the right thing or looking at the right information at the right time or making the right evidence-based decision. So one of the things, of course, that AI, machine learning, big data can do is, you know, read every paper, um, maybe help rank the evidence and hopefully provide that just in time to the clinician in terms of computer-aided decision support. So that even from something as simple as prescribing a new statin to a patient who has high cholesterol, I'm not just picking the average dose, 40 milligrams of atorvastatin. I'm looking at your pharmacogenetics. I'm looking at your renal function. I know what your scale was and what your blood pressure changes were. I might pick uh, simvastatin at 10 milligrams or 80 milligrams, depending on your genetics. And I think sort of some of that rules-based evidence, integrating the massive amounts of health information we have now can help us do a much better a job at not just uh, following algorithms, but improving those algorithms and providing that information to the provider. In terms of empathy, uh, you know, we want technology to hopefully enhance that. Uh, for example, an important part of health outcomes is how you interact with your health healthcare provider, your doctor. Even the doctor-patient relationship is, is therapeutic. And if I get a text from my doctor saying, hey, hey, Daniel, how are you doing on that new medication we prescribed? Oh, I say, oh, my doctor's paying attention. I might do a better job of just taking my medicine, even to do it for him or for her. So that's a little bit of a form of sometimes digital empathy. Even if my doctor wasn't really texting me by himself, it was through a software algorithm, that can help people be much more engaged with their medical team and find problems early. There was a Stanford or a San Francisco-based startup called Health Loop, which would send patients home after a, a total knee surgery, orthopedics procedure, and it would do a form of digital empathy. It would ask them, how are you doing today? Same, better, worse. Any pain in your leg on day three? And it would pick up problems earlier. Patients and their caregivers will feel more involved. And it would sort of use uh, those communication touch points as a way to uh, improve data and then clinical outcomes by sort of a form of empathy. But of course, machines can only do empathy to the point where they're programmed to. Not everybody interacts with health data and technology in the same ways. We talked about interoperability. There are there are new ways to connect the dots with HL7 and Fire that are going to help on that platform. But there's no substitute for humans in the loop. Um, but we can use technology to help keep humans in the loop and help us connect to our care providers and 
up-level information when it's necessary. Great, great. Um, that, that absolutely makes sense. We now have AI embedded in many health information systems augmenting human doctors in many ways for clinical decision support and e-prescribing, for patient triage and relapse prediction, image inter interpretation, robotic surgery. So how likely is, is the scenario, is the future where intelligent machines replace human doctors in every stage of, of healthcare, or will it just remain on the level of, as you call it, intelligence augmentation? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I mean, it's not about human versus machine or, you know, robot intelligence and AI versus human intelligence. I think the, the, the strongest outcome is in, in collaboration, the idea not of a robot, of a, a cobot. Um, you know, think about, I'm a pilot, I love flying in aviation, and I'm flying to Boston today on a 777 Boeing, right? which there are still two pilots on board, but the plane can essentially fly itself. And in many cases has the radar and the GPS and the situational awareness that can make that flight much safer than in the old days when it was a pilot flying by hand. Um, but we still have pilots in the cockpit, even though the entire process could be automated. So I don't think there's uh, gonna be a time very, very soon where the robot will do all the surgery without a human in the loop. But many elements of care can be augmented by not just the intelligence elements, but sometimes getting there before the clinician. So for example, um, we talked about the smart home and the connected devices. That data set that comes in from my steps and my sleep and my scale, my blood pressure, and even my refrigerator might start to integrate synthesized data. It's like just, wow, Daniel's likely to have a fall or a heart attack or a stroke or something's off that you would never be able to pick up by just looking at one day's worth of data. That AI algorithm can hopefully push that warning to my medical team. And that would be a sort of a bit, a bit of a collaboration. I would go in and hopefully have a more detailed evaluation. Of course, in fields like radiology, pathology, dermatology, even gastroenterology are integrating AI to not replace always what a, what a clinician will do, but in these fields that use a lot of pattern recognition, they can do some pretty magical things today, and let alone what's going to be here in the next decade. So I think the radiologists won't get replaced, but they don't need to look at every standard chest x-ray. They can spend more time on the difficult cases and integrate and synthesize and guide the rest of the care team. Um, but in some elements, I mean, the future is coming faster than you think. We're now seeing robotic surgeon elements that can suture anastomoses, uh, do components of a procedure better technically and, and sometimes even cognitively than a highly trained surgeon. So I think what this means is you'll be able to up-level, you know, whether it's an average surgeon using AI machine learning and computing and robotics to be as good as the world's best cardiac transplant surgery, for example. And so AI is not going to replace the doctor, but the doctor using AI machine learning and some of these tools will replace those who don't. And so it's a really interesting time, particularly when there's misalignments in how you integrate and pay for and regulate some of these tools. And also misalignments because many clinicians feel like their jobs might be threatened uh, or their procedures are becoming digitized. I'll give you one example. Um, I'm near Stanford University and some of my colleagues built a company called HeartFlow. It can now do a 30 second CT scan of the, the heart uh, and basically reproduce what we would get with a normal angiogram to look at the blood vessels and narrowing and risk for heart attacks and beyond. Now, the interventional cardiologists who used to get paid to do these catheter based procedures may not be so happy about the fact that now a, a less expensive and more rapid procedure uh, can um, do a virtual angiogram. But on the plus side, Patients might be found earlier who were not getting screened. That might give them more upside business in prevention or earlier uh, therapeutics. And so sometimes, you know, it's a matter of the technology catching up, the reimbursement, the regulation, and the incentives aligning. It's, it's never just about the technology. Yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. So the, these areas, I mean, the one that you just identified, like pathology, radiology, and others, are th these the ones where the application of intelligent systems will be most beneficial and probably less arguable? Well, it's already here. I mean, we already have you know, companies that have uh, been integrated into major systems, uh, uh, often systems that aren't fee for service, but are you know, more value based care where they don't need to pay for every x ray or every uh, pathology read. Uh, I think, again, that technology is already coming. It's just not evenly distributed. And when we start to show with trials that has been shown down the street at Stanford again, that uh, the AI radiologist can do a better job at finding that lung nodule and, and identifying whether it's cancer or non-cancer. Or when uh, a digital pathology image can not just say this is breast cancer, but can say it's HER2 positive or PR negative. It can understand the genetics sometimes just from the image. Uh, we're going to start to see these things getting integrated because it'll give us faster answers at lower cost and change health outcomes. 
So, you know, big picture, a lot of these technologies start expensive, uh, start with some, you know, misaligned incentives, but in the big picture can make healthcare, healthcare more democratized, more accessible. And because, 50% of doctors are below average. Uh, we, we need augmentation to help us make the right decision to do truly personalized precision medicine using the data that's hopefully crowdsourced from around the world and uh, really help move the needle to bring care anytime, anywhere uh, with better outcomes and lower cost. Okay, uh, reminding Babylon Health, the UK digital first health service provider, expansion to Africa, namely Rwanda, where about 30% of the population used the platform because of lack of medical providers in place, burst concerns that in the future access to the human doctor will be a privilege of richer people and the rest will be dealing with AI-based virtual medical consultants. What do you think about this scenario? I think the opportunity to use smart systems like Babylon or Ada or uh, Sydney Care, you know, chatbots uh, at, at some level that can help an individual use normal language, uh, ask a question about their health, get information back is tremendously powerful because we have huge disparities in who has access to health. You know, from Rwanda, where I've had a chance to visit and meet the gorillas, all the way to rural California, uh, you know, you know, 100 miles from San Francisco where I'm based, there's a shortage of specialists uh, to nursing, uh, and beyond. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity to sort of narrow the gap using these tools because knowledge is power. Now almost, you know, half the world population has internet access. Soon with technologies like um, Starlink from SpaceX, almost the entire planet will have high-speed internet access. And so that means platforms, AI, chatbots, virtual care can really democratize access. We've seen in China, there's a platform called Good Doctor that I think over 300 million Chinese are using that blends sort of the virtual element, you know, triage information about their basic health and blends that with getting actual care, whether it's going to a robotic drug dispenser or to a specialty hospital. So I think, yes, there will always be disparities in the world, but this can narrow the gaps. And I think, you know, health information is power. We know that many folks never get basic screening. Uh, they go to the emergency room too late or too early. And whether it's a chatbot or an integrated system like Babylon, uh, or ones that are rolling out from Amazon Care here in the United States. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to let people uh, touch health and medicine, get information that's applicable to them much earlier in much more personalized ways in language that matches them and culture with incentives that match their sort of interactivity element uh, and lower the, um, the, 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 the friction level of getting care and have hopefully much more healthcare engagement on the wellness side, not just sick care side, of the whole care continuum. So tremendous opportunity. Yes, there'll be disparities. We talk about the social determinants of health, but now we need to think about the digital determinants of health. Does your patient have a smart tablet? Do they have access to high-speed internet? Uh, is it in a language they understand? Uh, who pays for their internet bill? Uh, all those things are gonna come to bear. Uh, and I think it's an opportunity to connect the dots and bring more care everywhere uh, at any time. Right, I guess you, you can't ever get rid of disparities. I mean, is it in healthcare or in any other area? But you obviously don't need to go to Rwanda to feel the shortage, to see the shortage of doctors, of, of clinicians. I was gonna, I'll say on that point, you know, one, we, used, we, we tend to think about healthcare as a very sort of, let's say, doctor or nurse centric realm, but many parts of the world, rural Africa uh, to even uh, undeveloped, relatively uh, rural areas of the United States, a lot of care is not done by doctors, it's done by nurse practitioners or community health workers. And a lot of the potential for these technologies are now that they can sort of upskill anybody to have the skill of a highly trained, let's say cardiologist. So this is a, a technology you can buy now, it's a digital stethoscope called Echo. And I was never very good at listening to heart sounds. I trained in internal medicine and pediatrics. Now I can use this on a patient. It listens to the heart sounds, it does an EKG. It suggests this sounds like aortic regurgitation or mitral stenosis um, and that can help just a, a nurse uh, at, a, at a school or a workplace, or maybe even the patient themselves, uh, get diagnostics done anytime, anywhere, and then appropriately refer them to the cardiologist or specialist virtually or in person. So um, when we talk about democratizing healthcare and access to care, we don't need to think about it just through the lens of the fully board certified doctor or nurse or uh, pharmacist. Many places are virtual abilities to connect the dots, but now, almost anybody can use a tool like uh, a digital stethoscope or platforms like uh, the butterfly ultrasound. You know, what used to be a $200,000 device on a cart 
now can fit in the pocket of any medical student. And in some medical schools, instead of getting stethoscopes, you know, the old traditional device for doctors, let's say, they get a, a digital ultrasound powered by artificial intelligence, which means they can be in you know, Tanzania or in Tennessee and providing much better rapid diagnostics guided with AI machine learning that will, again, hopefully prevent diseases from being uh, picked up and treated at late stage, but at earlier stage. So lots of opportunity there at the, at the convergence. Let's just, you know, move for a while into this area of telemetry and healthcare data and, and the devices. Chris Dancy is arguably the most connected man on earth. I uh, don't know if you ever heard about him, with probably several hundred devices monitoring his daily activities and behavior. You mentioned four that you currently, four to five probably that you currently use. Is such awareness of individual environmental parameters and behaviors our way to a better life? Well, it's like anything else. There's no one size fits all solution. We think about personalized precision medicine, but we need to interact differently depending on your age, your culture, your incentives. I like data. I'm a gadget geek. I'm a physician. But many folks don't even want to see their data or they don't want to see it in a raw form. So someone like Mr. Dancy, who I'm aware of, you know, he's, he's the ultimate quantified selfer. He's quantifying his sleep and his steps and his voice and his environment and his blood pressure, things that most folks don't have access to. Uh, and he likes to have that information that gets him much more engaged in his health, the way he's wired, his brain is wired. He, he might see his sleep data or his diet information, and that helps him stay on the path to a much longer, healthier life. Other folks don't want to see it at all. Um, but, and we also don't want to end in a big brother society where you're measured all the time and you might be penalized. Um, because this data from the quantified self world can be used in sometimes dangerous ways, but sometimes positive ones. There's even been health insurance companies in the United States, or there's even been life insurance companies in the United States that will give you a lower premium if you're walking 10,000 steps a day, or you're doing your yoga and meditation app. So there's some positives to this. Uh, I think the ultimate uh, ability is to have the sensors go away. It's not just about wearables. We're now in the era of insidables, technologies that might live inside our body, like a sensor and a pacemaker uh, or a little chip underneath the skin. We're in the era of invisibles. You know, the camera that I'm talking to you through right now can look at my face and pick up my heart rate, my blood pressure, my respiratory rate, maybe my temperature, maybe even my blood sugar. And so we're going to start to be measuring things seamlessly. Wi-Fi, which is all around us, has been engineered by MIT engineers to pick up, you know, vital signs, uh, steps, behaviors, uh, cameras, voice, voice as a biomarker, all these things are going to be collected whether we want to or not. And what we want to do is synthesize that in a way that makes sense to us individually. Like the check engine light in a car hopefully synthesizes lots of data and starts to make sense of that in a simple way that gives us proactive guidance. And so I think this world now world of, of you know, Mr. Darcy being an exception is going to get easier and easier for many of us. I mean, even the little smart ring I'm wearing, you know, this, you know, weighs very little. It charge lasts for almost a, a week. And it's doing not just one data stream, but heart rate, heart rate variability, temperature, steps, helps not just tell me what my sleep score was, but what my readiness score is for the day. So these things are going to get easier, more integrated. You don't need to be a, a gadget geek to use them. And my hope is that all this quantified data doesn't stick with you on your smartphone. It goes from quantified self to quantified health, where the, the data and the insights, most especially, are going to start to flow to your doctor, your healthcare system, your pharmacist, and help you do a better job using your digital biomarkers to optimize health and wellness and prevention to keep you healthy, uh, do diagnostics at a much earlier stage, stage zero rather than stage three. And then if you have a disease, whether it's as common as hypertension or diabetes or mental health issue, to use sort of these quantified self tools to help uh, provide better feedback to adjust the therapy, whether it's a drug, a digital therapeutic, a VR platform, and again, to take that data and help knowledge improve for other patients with similar conditions. Right. Uh, let, me, let me be a little bit provocative here. Like most, let, let's take pulse oximeters. Like pulse oximeter is integrated into modern smartwatches and wristbands. Like most of those are not FDA cleared and probably should not be used for diagnosis and medical monitoring, which means that the results should probably be taken with a grain of salt. And uh, are we not being misled by vendors who suggest that these devices can provide insight into an individual wellness? How trustworthy are such sources of health information? How, how much do you trust your ring? Well, this ring is not FDA clear to track uh, 
uh, be a sleep lab, but it can give me pretty good early warning if my heart rate is super high or uh, some devices l- will listen to your snoring and predict who has sleep apnea. And even if it's not FDA gray, but it gives you an opportunity to have a conversation with your doctor uh, and provide some objective measure, not just your wife says you snore a lot, but that you know you have sleep apnea and your heart rate's peaking and your blood pressure is peaking. But your point is great. A lot of these consumer devices are not FDA grade, but some are. I mean, this is the uh, blood pressure cuff built into a watch band from Omron. Uh, you know, it's a bit large, a bit kludgy, but it does squeeze your wrist and give you an FDA uh, cleared blood pressure number. Um, but these are going to go away because we're seeing new technologies, some of which have been FDA cleared, that can be uh, integrated into a patch or into a wristband that can give you validated blood pressure or maybe even blood sugar pretty soon. And some of these technologies, what's been interesting over the last two or three years is some of these companies start as consumer plays. Like this is a little device called the Spire. It would measure your respiratory rate and your steps and your stress made to help you optimize your mindfulness or your meditation. But about two years ago, the reimbursement codes changed. The CPT codes changed for what's called RPM, remote patient monitoring, as you know. And now this company pivoted to make, you know, what they call, uh, I think they're called the, the Spire tag, health tag. You get a pack of 10 of these. I call them underwearables because you put one in your band of your underwear. You get 10 of them, so 10 pairs of underwear. Just put your underwear on and it's going to Bluetooth sync to your through your phone and, and track your steps and your respiratory elements. And now, because this is FDA-grade respiratory data and step data and heart rate data, these are being used to track patients with COPD or pneumonia or COVID at home and hopefully track them and keep them at in the home environment and not having a challenge that brings them back into, let's say, the hospital. So I, I think you need to take some grain of salt uh, with how good the data is, but more and more of these consumer technologies are getting FDA grade, uh, almost like when you go into a health store and there's uh, some nutrient that says, this is great for preventing colds and boosting your immune system. That's not always FDA cleared and gone through rigorous trials. What's happening now in the digital health space is a lot of these technologies are going through clinical trials. They are being validated. And we're going to end up with a lot more clinical grade data coming from our wearables, from our home environment. The challenge remains, what do we do with it? How do we synthesize it? Who's liable for that information? Are we getting paid as clinicians and healthcare systems to prescribe that connected blood pressure cuff? Is the doctor or nurse you know, incentivized to use that to help manage their panel of patients? So those are sort of the more high-level challenges, because I think uh, the ability to get FDA-grade data is, is exploding. Daniel, if, if there is a race ban, I'm not saying the reason that sends a signal every time somebody wants to pick a nose in public, we'd probably have fewer funny pictures of our politicians. At the same time, some studies suggest that wearable devices such as Fitbit or smartphone health apps provide little to no benefit on chronic disease health outcomes, some weight loss, no significant reduction in cholesterol or blood pressure. Still, in, in your opinion, which of these tools could probably be a game changer for any of us, meaning the long-term impact on an individual's health? Well, I think uh, you know the wearable by itself is a bit of a so what. These are becoming commoditized. You can get the equivalent of a highly next-generation Fitbit from China for 25 US dollars. It's not FDA grade yet, but it shows you how quickly these technologies are becoming commoditized and in many cases are becoming uh, regulated devices that have great data. But yes, just prescribing someone a Fitbit does not mean they're going to lose weight. Or giving someone a connected blood pressure cuff does not mean they're going to um, uh, stay on top of their blood pressure medications. They need to be integrated in a much more smart, personalized way. The user interface, the design thinking, uh, often is sort of ignored. I mean, even with our next generation wearables, the app looks the same whether uh, you are in Latin America, whether you speak Spanish, Russian, Polish, whether you're 70 year old or 17 years old. And so we all interact with our digital data in different ways. The digital natives, the, the 20 year olds, you know, interact very differently with, let's say their doctor. They wanna Snapchat and, and text their, their doctor or their nurse, whereas the baby boomer wants the hands on the shoulder and to actually have a physical visit. So that means you know, the sensor, the wearable, that may not prove that you can lose weight has to be put into an actually contextualized system. And there are several companies now using human coaches or sometimes even AI coaches that using the data from a wearable or a connected scale or blood pressure cuff, often in a social context, particularly when you're with a group of others who are trying to lose weight or manage their cancer or manage their diabetes, that really seems to show significant clinical benefits. It's not about any one data stream, but how you present it, how you feel, make that individual feel connected to the, not just the data, but the insights and help change their behaviors. In fact, 
you know, a one fun example is not just a wearable, but the idea of a trainable. So here's a sensor, an old version of a company uh, sensor from called Upright. It's a sensor that tracks your posture. So you put it on your back, and if you're bent over for too long, it gives you a little buzz. Oh, it's like your digital mother, <laughs> and it reminds you to sit up straight. And about a week of wearing this for an hour or two a day improves posture, even for the next two or three months when you're not wearing the sensor. So that's a bit of a feedback loop. Or about picking your nose, there's actually a, a, a platform called Pavlock, like from Pavlovian, which will buzz you or give you a shock if you are eating too fast or maybe biting your fingernails. So we're going to see the feedback loop start to come together where it's not just measuring something, but giving you a bit of a, a proper nudge that changes behavior. Because we know we already know you're supposed to exercise more and eat less, uh, but that doesn't mean people change their behaviors. 50% of patients on average don't take the medicines that they're prescribed. So we need to do a better job using these sensors to integrate with care. But I would you know, challenge your construct. Some papers have shown in looking at lots of trials that maybe there's not a lot of income, outcome. But when you design a trial well, or you use a connected blood pressure cuff with the right kind of app, there has been demonstration that People are much more on top of their blood pressure medicine. They've lowered their actual blood pressure numbers. They have less heart attacks and strokes. So it really depends on how you integrate it into, into care and how you integrate that into the workflow of the clinician as well. Um, so I think it's still very early days. Uh, we're going to move away from many wearables, as I mentioned, to the world of incitables, to the worlds of, of uh, invisibles, and that our digital exhaust, our digitome, will start to be collected 24-7, whether we like it or not. And we'll hopefully use that in smart ways to really personalize our nudges for prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Thanks for that. Let's talk a bit about digital therapeutics and digital rehabilitation that have been proven effective through the number of feasibility studies. Companies provide intelligent assistance to stroke survivors and to those suffering from mental disorders. Even on the basic level, simple step, step counters just get getting back a little bit to what you said, if used consistently, could be applied for medical purposes as part of a weight loss program. Still, clinicians seem to be in no rush to incorporate such tools in, in their daily practice. So what's the reason for it? And will anything change in future medicine? You're spot on. I mean, I think we can use a lot of these tools today. Clinicians are starting to in some places, but number one, it's not really part of their practice of medicine. They're not trained in medical school, whether they graduated last year or 20 years ago, to leverage our new connected mobile world. In fact, you know, I like to think about the challenge now. There's many solutions. When I gave a TED Talk in 2011, 10 years ago, about the future of medicine, there's an app for that. There were about 35,000 health and medical related apps. 10 years later, there's 350,000. And now we have connected stethoscopes and digital scales and smart blood pressure cuffs and many new apps that are much more integrated in. The challenge is the average doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or even healthcare administrator doesn't know what's available. So one answer is starting to have a bit of a digital health formulary. In fact, given that challenge, um, I've built a new platform called digital.health. I happen to get the website domain, digital.health. And it's a place made for clinicians to find solutions. You have a patient with atrial fibrillation, you might find you know, the AliveCore device, which is pretty well known to, to track for AFib and track an EKG at home. If you have a patient who has a mental health issue, you might prescribe them the Headspace app to meditate or Ginger IO for more significant mental health issues. Um, you may have a patient uh, who has challenges tracking their medication. You might prescribe an app. The challenge today is most doctors, nurses, pharmacists don't know what applications digital devices and, and synthesized devices and machine learning and AI exist, and they're not paid for by many of the insurance companies, whether it's a, a Blues plan or NHS or a Kaiser. So um, that's part of the reason these technologies aren't being used. Even a simple uh, step counter, when a patient goes home from surgery after, let's say, total hip replacement or total knee replacement, are they walking more or are they walking less? And the patient's are expected to walk more every day, but they start walking less, you can identify those patients and hopefully intervene before they have a complication or a fall. So it's about aligning incentives, aligning technologies, and making it easier to prescribe that connected blood pressure cuff and for that data to flow back into my electronic medical record in a way that um, gives me insight, not alarm fatigue, uh, but can move the needle across many, many diseases. Are you saying that in order for clinicians to recognize the benefit of all these devices, should that be a part of the medical education at college? It's part of the medical education in medical school and nursing school and continuing medical education. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, we now have a whole new set of tools. I mean, uh, the ability to do, you know, we'll talk more about telemedicine, but I've got a patient with uh, a mouth issue. You can put a little sensor on your camera and do a mouth exam, right? Uh, you have a patient who has 
uh, issues with sleep apnea, you can now track their sleep with a consumer wearable or a medical grade. Uh, the smartwatches of the day, whether it's from Samsung or Apple or others, are getting incredibly uh, more sophisticated. Um, some of them have FDA cleared EKGs, fall counters. They can remind you of your medications. They can show you when your heart rate is way out of range. Um, they can start to become that check engine light in the early stages. And you know, we're really only 10 years into this world of quantified self. The first Fitbit launched in 2009. Imagine where we can be in 10 years if we really start to integrate some of these new sensors into clinical trials, into disease management, into optimization of health. I mean, a lot of these ones today are worn by the super healthy, the ones who are biking and exercising and going to the gym because they want to quantify and measure their progress. Well, I think the norm will be in 10 years that for most every medical condition, you're going to be sent home from the clinic or the hospital or your virtual visit with some set of connected health tools. And hopefully not a pile of them, but you know, almost the equivalent of a, a medical tricorder. I helped run a, and conceive of an XPRIZE 10 years ago to make a medical tricorder, you know, synthesizing diagnostics. Imagine when each of us has the equivalent of a, a medical tricorder in our pocket or in our home, and that's used as part of our telemedicine visit, or the data from our watch or our, or our tricorder is something that your doctor sees when you walk into the clinic or when you walk into your virtual visit. So it's not just the intermittent reactive data, it's much more continuous proactive information that can really move us from sick care to healthcare. Daniel, I just, you, you've already mentioned that modern healthcare apps collect loads of private and sensitive data varying from how much alcohol you've had during breakfast to when period comes and goes. Um, you know, now I'm getting used to how I start seeing this ibuprofen ad as soon as my wristband capture is higher than normal body temperature. How can we protect our health information more reliably and how can blockchain technologies help us with, with this? I mean, healthcare privacy is really critical, um, but it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, as a patient, you often want to be able to share your health information, particularly in the setting of emergency. I've been in the emergency room when I was a resident at Mass General Hospital, patient with a cardiac issue. He would had prior studies done in a hospital across town. We had to call medical records, get them to fax over permission for them to send the data. Uh, I think that patient would rather have survived with their privacy in, without their privacy intact. Uh, and some well-meaning regulations like HIPAA were designed and launched before the digital age. So we need to think smartly about not just protecting data, but really enabling portability as well and enabling each of us who wants to be a data donor to share our data. Because yes, your consumer app, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, can glean a lot of information about you that's health related. Um, and many of us feel like you know, privacy might be dead. The younger generation shares everything. Older folks are a little more careful. But I think the, the opportunity is, number one, to make sure that every individual owns their health information, whether it's their genome, their metabolome, their microbiome data, but also has the ability to share it in smart, anonymized ways, sometimes using blockchain, sometimes using platforms like synthetic data, where you can contribute a data set and it becomes completely anonymized and can be leveraged by pharma companies and device companies and digital therapeutics companies. Um, I think there's a big need to enable that crowdsourcing. I always love the example of, you know, think about 15 years ago, we still used to drive with paper maps. Today, we couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or with Waze, right? Uh, you know, but it's, it, comes, it comes from us sharing our driving data, our speed and location. Your car and your mobile app knows where you've been, right? Even at two in the morning, what were you doing there? That's horrifying. <laughs> so be careful. You, you can turn off those settings and just like you can turn off the settings for sharing on your Google or your Maps or your Facebook or your Twitter, people need to know how to open up or restrict their healthcare data, whether it's their steps or their sleep or other private information, but also the ability when people want to hit the share button. Because I think just like we can build a Google Maps in ways for our driving, which is very local, it depends on what car we're driving, where we are, uh, what the weather is, where the, where the policemen are hiding out, we can build a Google Map or a ways for health data. That means we're all becoming data donors, but we get something back. We get back a map that helps us on our healthcare journey. And I used to joke about this Waze for Health. I was in Israel about two years ago, uh, and I met one of the founders of Waze who had issues with health and a family member. And they've now built a platform, a bit of a Waze for Healthcare called Stuff That Works, Stuff That Works Health, where patients can donate their data. And like my little medical condition, I have a sore foot. I've got plantar fasciitis. I found 10,000 other people who had plantar fasciitis sharing what's worked, what hasn't worked, stretching, splints, injections. And then they use AI machine learning to provide data back to you that's very relevant 
for your condition. So there really is this power of the crowd and the power of being a data donor that if we can unlock the safety issues and the privacy issues and enable anyone to share their data in private anonymized ways, we can really move the needle and build a, a bit of a global Google Maps uh, and ways for, for health information, for public health, for picking up pandemics, all the way to learning about treating individual metabolic diseases, cancers, and beyond. With the abundance of trackers, EHRs, and other digital tools for reading, storing, and exchanging exabytes of medical data, interoperability has probably never been of such a great issue as now. What progress are we really making on the way to the continuous flow of healthcare data? I think interoperability has been an issue for a long time. I was back at my first live conference at HIMSS in Las Vegas a few months ago, and you know, interoperability is getting better. We're seeing now you know, policy elements push communication to synthesize. We're seeing platforms like Fire uh, and HL7 make it uh, easier for different technologies to talk to your smartphone, for example, or now iOS is a platform making it better to integrate and be able to press a button and share that data. So I think uh, it's becoming less of an issue. Uh, the challenge more is that we have terabytes of data. Where is it stored? How is it synthesized? Who has access to it? Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, it's not about the data. We want the actual insights that can be used by the patient, by the consumer, by the clinician, by the pharma company, uh, by the holistic you know, global medical platform to, to improve uh, health outcomes. Um, so I, I, I'm not a uh, health IT expert to say, to say that interoperability is, is you know, doing X, Y, and Z. But what I would say is anyone designing a next generation sensor uh, or platform uh, to think about how it gets leveraged, to think about how it flows into the workflow, think about how you keep that data both private, but also accessible, uh, to think about um, you know, how you merge that with other forms. Because the future of medicine is built at this convergence of you know, losing AI, machine learning, blockchain, but layering that now on Internet of Things, wearables, insidables, sensibles, you know, even not just your microbiome, but your metabolome. You know, now in the last few years, you can get a wearable continuous glucose monitor that used to be only for diabetic patients, but now can be used to look at your, you know, your metabolome and help optimize your diet and personalize that, not just based on your blood sugar and your scale, but on your microbiome, your, uh, your, your genome, your pharmacogenetics. And so I think, you know, synthesizing all this data is more of a problem than just collecting it. Besides interoperability, there is also heterogeneity of healthcare data, which occurs from technical and clinical disparities across hospitals and research centers. The problem getting even worse from the global standpoint, for instance, a doctor working in a London hospital may use a specific protocol to treat a melanoma patient, while a doctor in a New York hospital may have different conventions to treat the same patient. This does not exactly facilitate the harmonization and analysis of data coming from different sources. How far are we actually from the absolute homogeneity of data in healthcare? Is it any way possible? Well, just like politics, healthcare is often very, very local. Um, so, you know, when I trained in internal medicine at Mass General, their protocol for managing heart attacks was a bit different than the Stanford protocol. Obviously, a lot of it was still based on same sets of underlying clinical trials, but things were done differently at the local level. But you also have different populations. You know, In Boston, you have a different ethnic mix and socioeconomic mix than you might have in Palo Alto or in San Francisco. Um, similarly, the data sets that support a lot of our older trials, many were based on, let's say, the Framingham trial You know, from Western Massachusetts and mostly European Caucasian healthcare workers. And so when we kind of discover whether it's the best treatment for a certain form of cancer or metabolic disease or heart attack, it needs to be built from data that's related, data and trials that are relevant to the actual population. So the genetics uh, for managing an African-American patient with asthma or hypertension uh, means a very different care pathway and evidence base than uh, a European Caucasian one, for example. So I think what's interesting about our new era is that we're now can do a Framingham trial on steroids. You know, you can now download a medical trial on your app. We've seen Verily, Google's health spin out called Verily, do the baseline trial, which is still underway with 10,000 or more individuals sharing their genome, their medical record, their digital data. We're seeing the National Institutes of Health has launched the All of Us trial. I'm one of the participants where I've shared my genome, my other lab data, my uh, medical record information, and even my Fitbit information to hopefully build that Framingham on steroids that will help, you know, have the standard of care available anywhere, but most applicable to the patient you're seeing. So I think it's going to become a bit of a gold, golden age of bioinformatics and the sometimes AI-assisted computer decision support to suggest 
everything from what diagnostic to what drug to what app to what uh, combination will become much more um, harmonized. And then we're going to use kind of that hive mind to improve the map and understanding for all of us. One other point is that as clinicians, we often are hopefully basing our decisions and our guidance on evidence-based data. Many of those might be a 10-year-old double-blind placebo-controlled trial from a very narrow patient subset, which had no comorbidities. Often you might have a patient uh, where there's no clinical trial relevance or they're not similar to those patients. Part of our continuous future will have our data lakes give us just in time, always updated clinical trial information that is most relevant to the patient or the population you're seeing. So I think that's going to be a really exciting future where we're going to get kind of that crowdsourced, you know, Google map element with evidence bases that are changing and updated continuously. Well, uh, devices are obviously getting smarter, care more accessible. You don't need to go to your physician on many occasions. Increased accessibility to own personal biometrics obviously requires certain handling, like careful handling and certain degree of medical awareness. A large amount of unexplained data can be frustrating or even misleading. Are we now seeing the reverse side of it when the uncontrolled access and mishandling of healthcare data can present a danger to an individual's health and well-being? Well, there's certainly uh, pluses and minuses to anything. You know, AI can be used for good. 3D printing can be made to print a medical device or a drug or a gun. <laughs> um, and medical data can be misused as well. I mean, if you were sitting in front of me and you had a sip of water from your glass, I could wipe that grass and sequence you. <laughs> and I could understand your risk for certain diseases. And if I was trying to hire you or you were running for president or prime minister, uh, and I disclose that information, that could be a significant game changer. So I think, you know, we also live in a pandemic age where we're in the midst of an infodemic as well, not just a pandemic. Sometimes it's too much good information about the disease itself, about vaccines, about drugs. It can also be misinformation, which we've seen being used in very dangerous ways, sometimes really much to the detriment in terms of the anti-vax world about folks not getting vaccines uh, or getting uh inappropriate, unproven therapies. So back to your question about, you know, uh, collecting devices and other data. If you're a hypochondriac, you might be logging into your data all the time and always tracking it, or you might be reassured that you don't have a heart condition because your watch is showing you that your EKG is normal and you're, uh, you know, look like you have a good cardiovascular profile. It may also, again, be used because our ambient environment can start to measure our health by your employer in bad ways, saying, hey, hey, uh, your typing is too slow or you're taking too many breaks uh, or, uh, you know, you, you say you're exercising this much, but you're not. So I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. We need to understand, again, who can opt into sharing their data, who has access to it, understanding that you can put a lot of things together. You know, already many organizations know a lot about you just by your search history from, from Google or your cookies on your smart tablet. I think health data is similarly um, available. Um, and if we use it again in smart ways, it can do a much better job of enabling health and medicine than some of the downsides. And we can't, you know, uh, be too uh, uh, extreme on trying to manage data and privacy and not allow, allow some of that amazing information and utilization to come to bear to impact disease and health around the planet. Right. I know. They, they, since you've mentioned sequencing, remote medicine continues to develop rapidly and seems to have no boundaries. One of your TED Talks you've mentioned medical selfies with the help of which a physician can remotely determine the state of a patient's urine. Back in 2017, two physicians from New York Presbyterian Hospital coined the name of what seems to be a new medical specialty, the virtualist. Are we now moving to a totally virtual medical care? And uh, is it possible for an average physician, you tell me as a doctor, to withdraw personal contacts with patients from daily clinical routine? Well, in many cases, there's an old study that said only about you know 20% of medical visits really need hands-on care. I think it totally depends on the situation. Telemedicine is not new. And virtual care in the setting of the COVID pandemic, you know, accelerated, I think, 17,000% in the spring of 2000. It's come down quite a bit. But many of us as clinicians or as patients have experienced our first virtual visits. And many of them like it. We like them. You don't have to take a half day off of school. It may be just a little post-op visit from a surgery or with a mental health worker. And a lot of that can be done virtually. I think that the best combination is when you have that personal relationship with your clinician and you're able to then augment that with a virtual visit uh, as well. Because in most cases, many of the apps that are out there, you press a button and you talk to some random doctor or random nurse. It's sometimes not about your con continuous care, but about something urgent or you know getting some medication that might be embarrassing to get in normal ways. I think the future is gonna be this synthesis again 
uh, virtual care and augmented care. In many cases, it won't be just seeing your doctor or nurse on the screen. It may be their chatbot. It may be their avatar. It may be that when I'm talking to you on the screen and you're my patient, I know your genomic information. I'm seeing the wearable data. I've seen your sort of sociome information. And using sort of the knowledge of others and, our, and a smart electronic health record, not just medical record, I'll, I'll be able to much give you much better guidance. And again, use that sort of early warning to uh, pick up a disease early and manage it in a much more smarter, continuous way. And that's not the future. I think that's already coming now. And, and the pandemic has been a bit of a, a catalyst for that. One other piece to think about is it's not just, again, about the, the patient on the screen. Now we have the ability to do, you know, labs on a chip, you know, whether it's a, a diagnostic that's, you know, connects to your smart smartphone. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, you know the, the smart ear analysis. Now you can use your camera, uh, not just to do a medical selfie of your face, which might pick up, you know, yellow eyes, which might be a high bilirubin or a, uh, a change in your facial structure, which might be a stroke. It can take a picture of your ear analysis dipstick, a company called Healthy IO. I'm on the board of, does that particularly effectively. Uh, also can look at wound care, you know, so all these elements kind of blending AI and cameras and vision is really set to be a game changer and will synthesize and integrate with a lot of our, our, our virtual visits. Indeed, one of the most promising areas of healthcare is telemedicine, which you've mentioned. It includes remote examination, diagnosis, and treatment of patients. As such, and you're right to say that telemedicine is no longer a new phenomenon, but we have seen a significant uptick in telemedicine visits triggered by the pandemic when people around the world were in quarantine and isolation significant progress has been achieved in remote diagnosing and managing various diseases like COPD, diabetic retinopathy, etc. What innovations in these areas should we expect in the nearest three to five years from your standpoint? Well, I think telemedicine is going far beyond the tele to sort of, you know, continuous care of which the telemedicine piece is, is one part. And a lot of that is that we can start to, you know, augment our tracking at home. You know, it could be platforms like uh, TidoCare where you know, you have the, the digital stethoscope and the otoscope and you can listen to the lungs and heart sounds and do an EKG. It might be uh, technologies like this one from a company called Neuraline where you can basically do eye tracking. It might be a patient who's had a, a stroke or a concussion and you can use this to sort of help quantify their brain or use these technologies to screen patients for risk for Alzheimer's, for example, because risk for Alzheimer's can be picked up by eye tracking elements and other approaches. So I think we need to think differently about, you know, our, our future of care. We've gone from hospital to home or hospital to hospital, where our technology is taking us from hospital to home to phone to on and inside our body. We're seeing this meta trend of the big pharmacies take healthcare technologies and bring them into their big box pharmacies, whether it's CVS or Walgreens or Walmart. And, you know, many patients don't live near a hospital, but they live near a Walmart or a CVS. And so they can go into these centers and get labs done digital diagnostics done, and even in some of these settings, you know, dental care, veterinary care, and mental health elements. So there's a big, big shifts in everything from our primary care to our specialty care, and uh, we're seeing new players come in from the Apples, Googles, Samsungs, Facebooks, to the, the Walmarts uh, of the world and the pharmacies like CVS, which are connecting the dots and enabling care to happen in new ways in the home, but on your corner pharmacy, on your body, uh, and beyond. And it's up to healthcare systems to adapt to that because, you know, it's a threat to some old business models. The hospital CEO wants their hospital beds full. The insurance company wants the beds empty. <laughs> so how do we, you know, design value-based care systems where, you know, you don't need a brand new hospital with hundred beds. You need a smaller footprint with leverage technology, lower cost imaging technologies, better telemedicine tools, which are gonna increasingly, you know, connect the dots and bring care anywhere, anytime. Daniel, one of the promising trends in modern healthcare is 3D printing. It's actively used to create medical tools, prothesis, drugs, implants. It has been used during the pandemic for printing masks, respirators, and even critical parts of lung ventilators. What's your view on this technology? It's real value, scalability, and efficiency. Can we say that in the nearest future, a great deal of medicine and medical equipment will be created by the use of 3D printing? Well, 3D printing is, you know, one of those other buzzwords, you know, 3D printing, AI, machine learning, big data. Uh, I think what's interesting about 3D printing is it's becoming consumerized. I mean, you, there's now a 3D printer 
uh, built by some students who came to a singular university called Made in Space. And they 3D print on the space station where you can print a ratchet if the astronauts lost a ratchet, or they could print a little brace for an astronaut who tweaked their finger, for example. You can't send up a, a new medical device easily to the space station. And the fact that these printers are getting small and cheap and can be in your home or in your clinic or you're in your operating room is going to give us a way to really start to use 3D printing across healthcare. In fact, it's already here. Um, most hearing aids are personalized to the inside of the ear based on 3D printing. Many orthodontists, you've seen the braces that are made basically by 3D printing uh, from a mold and changing uh, your teeth. Uh, we've seen some orthopedic companies 3D print medical implants. And we jump forward in the future, I think we might see a big change in medical devices because now you have to have a supply chain and a big closet full of devices. The future may be the patients in the operating room, you 3D print the implant, you 3D print the, the medical tools, you know, for example, but it can also be, it's perfect for prototyping, but you can also make a, a new medical device that fits your new smartphone. This is a, you know, a device you're looking in someone's mouth or someone's ears. And it goes all the way to an area that I've been innovating on, which is sort of, you know, the, the digital manufacturing or 3D printing or personalization of, of medications. You know, that addresses a couple key key pain points. And I always like to think about Technology, not about technology, but how do you solve a problem? And what's a big problem in medicine? Number one, adherence. A lot of patients don't take their medicines or they take too many medicines or they have to cut them in halves or thirds. Then there's personalization. How do we, again, match the right drugs and the right doses and make it easier to take? So I developed a little platform called IntelliMedicine where you can sort of 3D print you know, generic medications to start with that has, let's say, the patient's hypertension medicines, their ACE inhibitor, their beta blocker, their calcium channel blocker, maybe their Lasix if they have heart disease, maybe their Coumadin if they need blood thinning. And eventually, you could modify and print these in the home based on someone's data, you know, how much fluid they have in the lungs, what's their blood level, what is their mood. So it's an example of broadly, you know, when I think 3D printing, I think digital manufacturing, I think the ability to bring the right device or drug or form factor uh, to match the patient or the healthcare system's needs. Right, even some human organs are already, already been created on 3D printers back in 2019. Israeli scientists printed the world's first 3D vascularized engineered heart using a patient's own cells and biological materials. Can you explain how it works? Does that mean that we'll soon be able to print pretty much any organ for transplantation or, you know, some just some particular organs? And th th another question is, how soon this technology, if ever, become mass market and how much will it cost compared to a more traditional approach? Yeah, well, my research and clinical background is actually in uh, hematology, oncology, and stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. As a bone marrow transplant doctor, we use stem cells to cure many cancers, et cetera. Uh, but what's happening in the 3D printing world is we can use stem cells and progenitor cells as a form of ink, for example. And even before 2019, we're able to sort of layer different cell types together to make sort of microorgans, micro livers, micro pieces of kidneys, uh, micro pieces of cardiac tissue, and use those in the dish in the laboratory to study drugs and to speed up drug development. Others like the Israeli scientists you mentioned have built more functional uh, full organs, I think relatively small ones. The challenge is often not building the organ, but the vascularization, the blood supply, to the point where you can actually transplant that into an individual. Um, we are now seeing, obviously, this world of kidney transplants, kidney artificial kidneys you can wear outside the body, which aren't necessarily 3D printed, but an example of a, an organ function that doesn't happen to look like a kidney. It can be worn by the patient. I think we're still a little ways away from you know, 3D printing a liver, or a kidney, an organ, and being able to put that inside of a human. But we have been able to sort of 3D print biological materials and put that in a artificial liver that lives outside a patient who might have liver failure as a bridge to transplant. And combining that with stem cell biology, this new era of induced pluripotent stem cells, I think part of our future might be we'll donate some skin or some blood cells, we'll turn it into our own IPS stem cell line, we'll differentiate liver, heart, uh, brain tissue. So if you have an accident, a heart attack, or stroke, or liver failure, you'll be able to pull out some of those progenitors out of the freezer, and they'll already be made, they'll all be personalized to you, maybe in combination with 3D printing, uh, to help uh, manage uh, an injury, disease, uh, or some other uh, uh, issue that causes a need for new organ function. And again, 3D printing has already been applied in some forms with skin on burns. You can spray on uh, uh, cells from the patient or from donors. And I think it has huge applications across regenerative medicine, but uh, hasn't quite reached its full potential yet. Another equally interesting topic is virtual and augmented reality in medicine. Interestingly, these technologies can not only be used as simulators, for example, for surgeons, but also I see their benefits for improving physician's empathy to patients and for better understanding their condition. 
For example, in bonded lambs or putting in the shoes of Alfred, a 74-year-old African-American with macular degeneration and high-frequency hearing loss. As Alfred goes by his daily life, the learner will understand how hearing and vision impairments affect communication and impact an individual's well-being. Sounds weird, but we can get access to the areas that aren't available for a healthy individual. How can we leverage this opportunity? So augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, that's one of my favorite fields because it's really the, it's this convergence at this interface of all these sorts of platforms, wearable computing, high-speed bandwidth, new generations of sensors and motion sensors. You know, we can look back, what, six, seven years ago, this was the coolest tech there was, the old-fashioned Google Glass, remember these? These were not a great hit for, uh, you know, consumers, but they've been increasingly utilized uh, in the medical space. Even Google Glass is now a enterprise version uh, and there's platforms and companies that use glass technologies to enable the clinician to see data about their patient, uh, to record information and beyond. But I think what's exciting is number one, you mentioned digital empathy. I can now go into a low cost uh, headset. Uh, you know, uh, here's one from Pico Labs. Some of you have seen Oculus Quest headsets. They're only about what, three or 400 US dollars. Um, they used to be a millions of dollars worth of technology that you'd only find at a Stanford virtual reality lab. And so now this enables almost anybody to, yeah, not just be in the shoes of a patient, but understand their limitations, whether a patient has macular degeneration or has hearing issues or mobility issues. You can sort of feel what it's like to be them. You can look in the mirror and see yourself as a different age or race uh, or with a handicap. And so that's one piece of it. Uh, it also can be used for therapy. You know, virtual reality is becoming a therapeutic tool. You might have a patient with bad burns and extreme pain. You can put them in a VR headset in a cold environment, throwing snowballs at penguins through an app called Snow World, for example, and they use less than half as amount of opiates and pain medications. Or these are great for virtual reality tied to physical therapy. You can play a game, moving your arms, your legs, and getting scored on that and engaging folks in physical therapy. Uh, it's being used especially in the future and today of medical education. You might be an orthopedic surgeon. You can go into an app called Oso VR and you're in the operating room and you can practice a uh, total knee replacement or a, a much more rare complication. And just like a pilot in a flight simulator, the surgeon or the doctor or the nurse or whomever can now simulate what often would be very difficult to practice and do that many, many times, not just by themselves, but often with their teams. So many of us who are medical people, we, we train to see one, do one, teach one. The future is going to be C1, simulate, 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 just like an airline captain simulates emergencies and difficult landings and bad weather and what's called crew resource communication. How are you communicating with your team in these environments? So I think that's going to really improve care as we go forward, all the way to the point where your surgeries, your procedures of the future are going to be blended with augmented reality. Uh, HoloLens, Magic Leap are becoming better and better and cheaper. So the future of many interventions, you're going to be seeing the patient. You'll sort of see through the patient, their anatomy. You might be guided step by step, kind of a GPS for a procedure. And so this entire field is really set to impact almost every element of healthcare in some way. Right. And speaking of, of personalized care, would it, would it be possible for us sometime in the future to create a virtual model of any patient based on the existing complaints and individual parameters so that a clinician can embody the patient in order to closely engage with them. I think what you're talking about here is now we have this explosion of data as we've talked about, whether it's from your digitome, your sociome, your genome, your microbiome, your metabolome, you pick it, right? And what we try to do as doctors and as folks trying to manage patients is take the best available data and, and pair that to our patient. But it's like now an overwhelming amount of data and even the insights are hard to connect. Our brains haven't had an upgrade in several million years, but our technology is upgrade all the time and new, new information is pouring in. So there's this new term often called the, the digital twin, where uh, you can imagine for each of us and for each of our patients, we'll sort of have a, a virtual avatar, you know, where we can sort of dial in, what happens if this patient loses 50 pounds or changes the medication, uh, or we optimize their, uh, their drug levels, uh, or we put in a certain medical device, or we use a certain app that uses the data from past patients and simulations of future ones to really predict What's optimal for that patient for wellness and prevention, for doing the appropriate diagnostic workup? And then most importantly in therapy, you know, what do we choose that really matches that patient and use that almost like a, a, a simulator uh, would simulate, you know, a flight simulator or SimCity for simulating what happens in a city. So many moving parts, we're going to start to integrate that. And I think that's part of our, our future of health and medicine and our ability to be data donors uh, as well as data users to kind of build those better avatars uh, going forward. 
then on, regardless of how fast health technologies have been progressing, my feeling is that it's only rare companies and healthcare systems that are able to keep up with such rapid development, meaning the gaps in their infrastructure, the outdated hardware, undereducated personnel. This is just a short list, list of issues, but it's actually very long. At the same time, the upgrades require enormous investment. Would the cost of it be justified compared to the expected positive outcomes? Well, number one, uh, we're spending more and more dollars, particularly in the Western world. I mean, approaching 19% of our GDP in the United States, it's unsustainable, but our health outcomes aren't even getting better. In, in the United States, the average life expectancy has actually been going down, sometimes from the opioid epidemic and other elements, and certainly the, the, the COVID pandemic. We're not getting more for our dollar in many cases. Um, we also know that we might have the best and most amazing science fiction type technology, but it's not always being implemented. We've talked a lot about that in this discussion. And in many places, we don't practice you know, exponential medicine, we practice incremental medicine. Everyone wants to be very, very careful and move in little tiny steps. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is it's helped us crowdsource, collaborate, bring new vaccines to market, do digitized trials. We're learning from you know, initially the intensive care units of Wuhan to Italy to New York so that what we learned in how to manage sick COVID patients has been faster, more quickly shared as well. So yes, there are many barriers and many times uh, the technology is expensive, but I think big picture is going to actually lower costs. It's going to improve, as we mentioned earlier, access to care, whether it's through telemedicine or AI or chatbots or combinations. It's going to provide, again, much more proactive information so we can find the disease before the heart attack, the stroke, the late stage cancer, or the infectious disease hits. It's powering you know, new low-cost home diagnostics. So we'll have not just a COVID test at home, but we'll have tests for the flu and RSV and non-infectious diseases. It's opening up worlds of telemedicine and beyond. And as we start to show in rigorous ways that these technologies and solution sets, when applied appropriately, can bend the cost curve, uh, especially when we're proactive, we're doing healthcare, not sick care, and we're preventing the patient from getting diabetes, or we're screening them with the medical selfie and urinalysis to find out who has got protein in their, in their urine before they end up in renal failure and need a kidney transplant or dialysis. We're going to hopefully show that a lot of what's coming, and it's still the dots aren't always connecting quite yet, really have the opportunity to, to lower outcome, to improve outcomes at lower costs and get every individual and community and healthcare uh, worker much more engaged in health in a much um, smarter, data-driven and insightful way. Right. Speaking of, as, as a clinician, you obviously seen instances of mistrust of the new technologies, either on the patients or on the provider's side. So what can we as techno technological companies do better in order to overcome these? That's a great question because we've seen through the pandemic, especially in this infodemic, that many folks I may mean, have all the evidence in front of them, but they're still never going to believe in that vaccine because it's genetically engineered and has a, a microchip. But at the same time, they'll take synthetically derived antibody therapies if they do develop COVID. So I think, number one, we need to step back and think about health education uh, at the earliest levels from little kids to folks in high school, college, to understand, you know, what's a clinical trial? Why does science change? You know, it was first no masks and then masks and information on this, and it seemed to have changed. That's science. That's how we learn and evolve. So while there's been levels of distrust, that distrust has had high mortality and high morbidity, depending on where you get your news sources, particularly in the United States. If you get sources from one source of news, your likelihood of getting COVID and having mortality and morbidity is much higher than another. So information as a drug is powerful. And I think we need to be smart about health education uh, as we go forward. And helping different communities as well. In the African-American community, there's distrust that goes all the way back to the Framingham trials. Uh, not there's distrust that goes all the way back to the Tuskegee experiments where African-Americans were exper experimented on without their knowledge or uh, understanding. So we need to meet different communities where they are and start to establish better trust. Physicians used to be highly trusted, hospitals, healthcare systems. That's changed quite dramatically uh, uh, in some settings uh, during the pandemic. We need to heal that understanding of science, medical progress, so that we can trust what the FDA says, the CDC says, WHO, and uh, it's super critical because mistrust has led and will lead to you know, really bad outcomes. You think we could have avoided the COVID pandemic in a world where every hospital and every person in every country was equipped with the technologies we've spoken about? It. Well, you know, an epidemic, there's many epidemics, but we want to prevent them from becoming pandemics. And 
you don't need to have all these technologies in everyone's hands. Sometimes it's about sifting the information. You can tell by people on social media reports or small changes in air travel, uh, not a scientific molecular test, that there might be a problem going on. You know, an early example might be there's an epidemic of, of a GI infection. And you can tell because the, the normal pharmacies, they're all running out of their Pepto-Bismol and their GI elements. Or people are doing searches on Google, but how do I treat a GI complaint or fever or a rash? So sometimes these digital biomarkers can be picked up. Uh, I think we need to do a much better job now in public health. We've seen the huge costs in lives and dollars and uh, mental health from the pandemic. I think we have an opportunity to particularly leverage these technologies to help prevent the future pandemic and manage the current one. I've been the chair of the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force, uh, and our alliance is made up of 100 plus organizations from big NGOs to small startups to academic groups to Fortune 50 companies. And we've looked at how to do better PPE, better, faster, frequent, cheap testing platforms, better ways of communication to avoid the uh, a pandemic. So I think the silver lining again is that through platforms like the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance and others, we're, we're learning to solve problems faster, to collaborate in new ways, and the solutions that come out will help prevent the next pandemic and better manage all elements of, of healthcare around the world. Daniel, how do we ever, ever understand that we finally arrived in the health age? Well, you know, the future is coming faster than we think. You know, what used to feel like science fiction uh, is here. You know, Star Trek, uh, you know, inspired this X Prize for Medical Tricorder. And uh, just this past month, William Shatner flew to space uh, on an Amazon built, you know, Blue Origin rocket funded by Jeff Bezos. So. Uh, Many things are out there, but they're now, you know, maybe in the hands of the of the very few. Not very many people have gone to space yet on a commercial space flight. You know, technologies like, you know, the smartphone are democratizing access. I mean, early on, these were expensive. Only the super rich had a mobile phone uh, and the early smartphones were, were more expensive and very rare. Uh, the early Teslas were much more expensive. And now we're seeing uh, examples of, you know, uh, electric vehicles expand around the world, even self-driving. So I think we have entered this health age. My friend Regina Dugan, who used to uh, run DARPA, likes to say that just like Sputnik sparked the space age, COVID sparked a bit of a new health age, whether it's telemedicine, new forms of vaccines, new ways of doing public health, better collaborations, you know, from lab to laptop, from hospital to home. And uh, I think we're entering this age. It's up to all of us to understand not just the technology that's here today in 2021 or 2022, but be like Wayne Gretzky and skate to where the puck is going to be, where, where AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, genomics, blockchain, CRISPR, drones, are going to be in 2025 and 2030. Um, because like Bill Gates once said, uh, we all tend to overestimate what will happen in a year and underestimate what will happen in a decade. So we can't have a failure of imagination. We also need to help bring our colleagues along who are often stuck in the past and using fax machines and CD-ROMs and paper forms and take the solutions of today, you know, leveraging platforms from our EMRs to platforms like I built like digital.health or elaborations to sort of bring us from incremental medicine to exponential uh, and bring us into a health age that is applied to all of us, not just those of us who might live in, in big Western cities, but means almost anybody can have access to smart diagnostics, a chatbot, telemedicine, genomic sequencing. Um, so to really fulfill our opportunity to reach uh, a health age that uh, brings that uh, for all of us here on, on Spaceship Earth. I just can't miss this opportunity speaking with the oncologist. Please answer me. When shall we cure cancer? Well, forgive me, but I think that's the wrong question because there's no one cancer. We've had the cancer moonshots, et cetera. But um, even when you talk about lung cancer, you're talking about a thousand different molecular subtypes, let alone breast cancer, let alone pancreatic and others. So I think the real promise now, and it's we talked about this health age, is that we're entering a time now where you can do just a blood test, a blood biopsy, a company called, uh, um, has a platform called Gallery from, from Grail Therapeutics that's just come to market. So a blood biopsy, looking at mole molecular signatures, can find up to 50 types of cancers early, when if you detect them early, you have a chance of saving a life or mortality and morbidity. And so we're starting to understand almost every disease, whether it's cancer or diabetes or autism, uh, you pick it at not just the usual old way of defining it, but at its molecular, at its epigenetic, at its digital phenotype. And particularly with cancer, I think it's particularly exciting because now we're understanding them at the molecular basis. We're able to design not just, you know, carpet bombing chemotherapies, much more targeted immunotherapies, tumor vaccines, which are going to be built on the, on the platform of mRNA are going to be particularly exciting. So from the oncology perspective, we're going to get much better at detection. Um, number one, understanding who's at risk based on their genetics. Number two, screening in different ways, uh, not just doing colonoscopies and mammograms or even 
obviously molecular tests for your stool, so you don't need the colonoscopy, or wearable mammograms that can be done at home to do early detection. And then when a patient does have an early or late stage cancer, to target it in much more interesting ways with cell therapies, with immunotherapies, with combinations of drugs, sometimes old generic drugs in combination. So it's a, it's a new golden age for oncology. Uh, and I'm excited uh, to that, for that field to really uh, meet its potential. Daniel, as you speak a lot of the future health, which of your prognosis have already come true and which ones as you now probably understand are unlikely to happen? I think, you know, it's, it's easy to, I, actually, I don't call myself a futurist. I always think myself more of a nowist. I'm a bit of an accidental futurist. I just happen to be lucky to be crossing different fields from aerospace medicine to internal medicine, pediatrics, medical devices, uh, being in places like Harvard and Stanford, are great milieus where you have folks from all different fields. So I think this future medicine isn't being built by the doctors and pharma and med device folks often, but people come from the Googles and Facebooks and video gaming and blockchain and, and uh, uh, quantum computing. And so um, one of the things I predicted I think has come true is a bit of this you know, check engine light for the body. The fact that now your smartwatch can tell if you have early diabetes, heart disease, or maybe even COVID or a common flu. Uh, and that's not yet democratized, but that's sort of come to reality, synthesizing data streams using AI machine learning to predict before you end up having the problem. That's one thing uh, that I think is, is ripe for uh, really meeting reality. Or the fact that now, uh, my old talk, you know, future medicine, there's an app for that. Now there are apps that are FDA approved to treat everything from ADHD with a video game to treating mental health issues with VR or with a drug or going beyond the pill with a drug layered with software and sensors. Um, one of the things that I think hasn't quite reached its maybe hype potential is, let's say, the field of nanomedicine. We've talked for a while about being able to build micro machines that might be artificial blood cells or artificial uh, immunologic agents that could go through your bloodstream and uh, create a fantastic voyage. We haven't quite yet achieved the, the full promise of AI. Platforms like uh, IBM Watson had a lot of hype but haven't quite reached its promise. But I would say in this world of accelerating technologies, we all know Moore's Law, the power of computing, it is getting more and more incredible. I mean, my iPhone 12 you know, is 10 years uh, newer than my iPhone 2. <laughs> my iPhone 2, 10, 11 years ago, seemed amazing. Now it feels slow and clunky and has a low resolution camera. In 10 years, my iPhone 12 or 13 is going to look antique and may have dissolved in my contact lenses or uh, into my AR uh, glasses. And so I think we can't have a failure of imagination of where technology can take us. It's not just Moore's law, it's Amara's law. We tend to, again, overestimate what might happen in the short term, but underestimate what might be here in decades. So while nanotechnology and some of AI hasn't reached all of its potential, uh, of what we thought might be here, I think the next few years is really going to accelerate that, particularly because a lot of these innovations and problems are being solved by folks who come from other fields, converging and working with doctors and pharma and med devices and, and patients in a much more collaborative, integrative way. What will be the next most important technological breakthrough in healthcare? Well, I've always been an advocate of not one technology, but their sort of super convergence. Uh, you know, the Moore's Law applied to AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, genomics, chatbots, you know, uh, you know, so it's not any one technology, it's how you blend them together to, to address a, a pain point, a medical problem. And um, I think because a lot of these technologies that used to be very difficult to access, whether it was, you know, reading and writing DNA, that's become democratized. You can get a full genome that used to cost $10 million done for 200, 300 US dollars. You can now buy a drone, not just to take pictures, but to deliver medications uh, or uh, uh, deliver uh, blood in rural areas uh, of Africa to rural areas of, of Florida. So I think it's not about thinking about one technology, but how we mash them up in really impactful ways. Uh, and to think, you know, a lot of solutions uh, can come from this overlap. Think about a company like Uber, right? Very successful company by most measures. They're an exponential company. They didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online maps, online payments, or limos and taxis. They connect the dots to solve a pain point of it's hard to get a taxi. Uh, then you have to pay for it on paper. Uh, you can't track your receipt. You know, they've Uberized uh, a pain point. I think there's a lot of the sort of Uberization of healthcare to, to solve problems. So I think when you're trying to think of a problem as a patient, as a doctor, as a healthcare administrator, as a health technologist, uh, you want to be thinking about how you put uh, technologies together to address things in new ways and to fit that with the regulatory process, reimbursement process, uh, and the incentives of clinicians and, and, and patients. So um, I would say on the caveat, we talked a little bit about AI. 
what's happening with fields like GPT-3 and sort of next generation AI where it can, you know, draw a picture for you, make an app, design uh, software is going to be quite transformative. Beyond traditional computing, there's quantum computing, which isn't quite here fully yet, but has the ability to really transform drug discovery and personalized medicine. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to go from, uh, you know, 5G to, to 8G and, you know, the ability to, to, to swap information is going to be incredibly uh, powerful. And virtual reality, which we touched upon as well, is going to become much more and more blended with our day-to-day -day reality, whether it's our you know, next generation Apple glasses or contact lenses. And so when you're doing that physician visit or that telemedicine visit, it's going to feel like you're in the same room or with your colleagues, or you can bring someone else to coach you in the, in the, in the operating room. That's already happening, but it's going to become uh, like that on steroids. And again, my big hope, as we've talked about, is that we're going to make not just more data, but much more actionable insights that can be applied hyper-locally to your patient or your community uh, and do that in a way that really brings out the, the best in prevention, the best in early diagnostics, and the best in, in less invasive, less costly, and more democratized, digitized uh, therapeutics. Daniel, that was the last one in my end. I can't thank you enough for the time and for the valuable insight into the future of health, which I hope is not too far away. Well, thanks. It's been great to be with you. You know, the future of health is uh, happening faster than most people think. Uh, a lot of the technology is here. It's just not evenly distributed, right? Uh, and it doesn't need to be, you know, gadgets and widgets. It's about how we connect the dots. So for all the folks, you know, watching or listening, I would say if you have a, a clinical challenge or public health issue, look to see what solutions are already built. You don't need always to need to reinvent the wheel. Or you can find a, a smart college student to build the app for you that matches a solution. And not to have a failure of imagination and to not wait for the solutions to arrive to you. Find them out or create them yourselves because... We have the opportunity not to just imagine this future medicine, to, to, to boldly create together collaboratively to improve healthcare for all. Thanks again. Have a good one. Thanks.